Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. And so I'm not going to talk to you about my favorite C20 feature because contacts is not my favorite feature. My favorite feature, I which is much more advanced at this point, is modules. But the feature I, is I am working on is contacts. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it was working. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm a C++ programmer. I started writing C++ in 1989. At that time, I was an intern in, in a company, and they gave me Bruce Eccles' book using C++, an old book, and they told me, oh, you are going to prototype something in a language that nobody uses, try out, but probably this is, no, uh, this is going nowhere. And, you know, a few years later, I'm still writing C++ code most of the time. I'm also a professor in computer architecture. And uh, I, my main hobby is being in the C++ standards committee where I have been for the last 11 years now. And I have some interest uh, helping people to improve their code bases in multiple ways, better performance, better energy efficiency, better maintainability and reliability. And probably what I am going to talk about today is mostly related to maintainability and reliability. So uh, I am in a research group where my main topic is programming models for application improvements, and we have had a number of projects funded by the European uh, Commission. Uh, but let's talk about contacts. So why did we start to talk uh, about uh, contacts? Because we are concerned about writing correct software. If Software doesn't need to be correct. It can be arbitrarily fast. The problem is that first it needs to be correct. Uh, next question, isn't a library solution for contacts enough? Have you tried that? And we have tried uh, multiple times and one problem that we found is that compilers and static analyzers do not understand well that approach. It's something that you have in your library and the only thing that you can do is check and fail. That's not really enough. Uh, what did others do? We had a look what other languages have been doing around and there have been solutions in D. Uh, Ada 2012, also has a, a solution and C Sharp has a code contacts. So some of these things could inspire us, but we needed to do a lot of customization for what, I what can be done in C++. The, these ideas are not new. Uh, there is this paper in 2005 was the first proposal of adding contacts but you know, in this nightmare of C++ OX, which it was going to be 05, 06, 07, 08, 09, oh, 10 is not a digit. Yes, it is, it's an hexadecimal digit. And finally, it was 11. So some features and some proposals got lost in all this uh, process. By when we had C++11, the original ideas that were proposed could not fit well with some features in uh, C++11. And then uh, in 2013, there was another proposal uh, from John Lakos uh, for adding contacts. Now, this proposal 
was heavily based, uh, heavily based in the use of macros. So, Odin, what do you think about macros? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, we could do much better uh, with contracts with other approach. So, we had multiple competing proposals uh, and a lot of discussion in the standards committee. And finally, two years later, we were able to have a common proposal that we have been uh, evolving and that we still are trying to target uh, C20. So this gives you more or less a history of what has been happening around. So what happens uh, with software? Uh, I believe that in the design of a library there is a tension between two highly related features. One is robustness and the other one is correctness. And uh, I think many times we tend to confuse both features. Correctness is the degree to which a software component matches its specification. While robustness is the ability of a software component to react to abnormal conditions. That means that correctness has to do with writing correct software, writing the right software. While robustness uh, has to do with, okay, somebody cut my network cable uh, and I have to react to that. While correctness has to do, I didn't write properly my software. And uh, I, I mean, it, it's not easy to draw a clean line between both properties, but there are cases that are in each side. So you wanted to say something or not? It doesn't matter to me if they are inside or outside. Today, what happens is that most libraries use a single feature for managing both things. So we have exceptions and we use exceptions for both things, for a correctness problems and for robustness uh, problems. I claim that they are different things and that they should be handled in different ways. So let's see what we do in the standard library. When something bad uh, happens, we use exception for reporting that something went wrong. Uh, for example, we use Batalog. I could not get memory and I throw bad log. If a library detects an assumption that has not been met, we need to react. And when a, an assumption has not been met, there's a contract violation. What do we do with contract violations in the standard library? Well, depends. Sometimes we ignore. Uh, sometimes we document, but we ignore. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we throw exceptions. And this is not consistent uh, through the whole library. So robustness and correctness should be orthogonal properties, and we should manage them independently. So let's go with robustness in the standard library. So we identify and, ha and handle abnormal situations that happen in completely correct programs. So I, I have the best programmer in the world, I write the best software in the world, but still I have uh, a problem. For example, I need to allocate memory and I have run out of memory. So I cannot prevent that. So th that is 
something that I need to be prepared to, uh, to handle. So that is an example of robustness. An example that uh, comes out every, th every time that I talk about this is end of file. So is end of file a robustness problem? Uh, if you look at some programming languages, they handle as a robustness problem and they throw an exception. Now, you open a file, you read the first byte, you read the second byte, and then suddenly it's end of file. Didn't you expect that reading byte by byte at some point you will uh, uh, reach to the end of the file? It's really a surprise to you. No, no, this is a different state of your program. It's not a robustness problem. It's not a robustness problem at all because it is something that is going to happen every time you run your program. So the C++ standard library identifies those cases by specifying the condition that fires the situation and the exception that will be thrown. So for example, in allocator you have allocate throws but alloc if storage cannot be obtained. Now, correctness is about finding errors in your programs or errors in your library because sometimes we write buggy software. Only sometimes. Uh, now, who's guilty? A content violation happens perhaps because the caller did not fulfill the expectations before calling the function. So it's the caller's fault. Or the colleague does not fulfill what should be ensured after its own execution. We typically call this the preconditions of the function and we call this the post conditions of the function. And in either case, we have a correctness pro uh, problem. A program failure is usually du due to external conditions and cannot be avoided, while a correctness uh, problem, a contact violation, should never happen in a correct program. So that, that is the key difference while I think both things are orthogonal and they should be handled independently. So look here in the standard library. By violation of preconditions specified in a function requires paragraph results in undefined behavior unless the function throws paragraph specifies throwing an exception when the precondition is violated. So this is a general blanket statement in, in the standard that uh, applies. And what does it mean in practice? In practice, it, it means that there are two things that the standard library does. Sometimes, do nothing. Library and defined behavior, okay? So you pass the wrong iterator and define behavior. You pass a null pointer to a function that does not expect to receive a null pointer and define behavior. But sometimes it notifies you of your programming mistake, throwing an exception. For example, vector at throws an exception if you pass an index out of bound. Okay, so we have these two things. Exceptions are okay for robustness. We need to do something for correctness. And the thing we, prepo we propose to do for correctness is contracts. So a contract is the set of preconditions, postconditions, and assertions associated with a function. So starting from here, we will uh, start, we, we will forget the introduction and we will see code. I think you want to see code. So uh, what is a precondition? Is any expectation of the function? Don't pass me a null pointer. 
What is a post condition? Is something, some condition that the function ensures I'm going to return you a positive integer. And then we have assertions, which are predicates that must be satisfied at, at some specific point in your code, which is not the entry point and is not the exit point. Anywhere in the middle. So the precondition uh, holds uh, at entry and uh, we use for annotating the, the code the attribute syntax, this ugly double bracket syntax. So you will see where our preconditions and postconditions are. So here you, ha you have an example. I have my square root function and you see here expect x is greater than zero. This is a precondition. Now the precondition and postconditions are attached to the interface, not to the implementation. And this is a key point that will make that you will have to write your preconditions and postconditions as part of your header files or your interfaces. They are not an implementation detail, and this has a number of implications. So the syntax is expects, colon, and then you have any Boolean expression where you can use, for example, uh, argument names. Uh, you can use some other things, but for this would be a simple example. Or you have this member function, and I could say push expects that the queue is not full. So this is a modified uh, attribute syntax, and this is part of the function declaration. Now, a post condition is a predicate at the exit point, and this is also going as part of the function interface. So the, this is also externally visible. And we use the keyword ensures, which is another new attribute. So I could say that I expect that X is unmodified, perhaps, uh, but the most inter interesting case for uh, a post condition is ensures, and then I can introduce a new identifier. This is any identifier you want, which is going uh, to represent the result of the function, the, the return value of the function. So we do not restrict to a keyword, some other languages did, we decided to uh, just introduce before the column, and then you can use it to reason about the result of the function. Okay, so that is basically, now you know how to write preconditions and postconditions. And then we have assertions that they are meant for the body. So basically, the difference with assertions is that you can write them anywhere in your function body and you are stating some condition at some point that uh, needs to be held. So what is the effect of having contracts? A contract should not have any observable effect on a correct program. Why so? Because a correct program never violates any contract at all in the ideal world. Uh, well, the only observable effect that you might have is performance. Because if you are checking all your contracts, this could be slower. But other than that, you don't notice anything else. Now, in a, an incorrect program, there is an observable effect because you are going to check and something bad happens and then we need to do something. Uh, we use the attribute syntax because contracts, th this is to highlight the fact that depending how you build, contracts might be checked or not. So 
this uh, proposal is going to introduce something new to the C++ standard, which is the concept of build modes. Until now, we don't have that concept in the language. We have a single build mode. You have your compiler with release uh, mode and debug mode, but this is something from your compiler. This is not something that the standard mandates. Now we are going to mandate multiple build modes. Uh, second thing, attributes are not, pa are not part of the function type, which means that, uh, for example, when you take pointers or for mangling, they don't have any effect, but contexts are not an optional feature. If they are uh, put in C++20, it will be mandatory for compilers to implement it. Uh, so what happens with uh, checking? It depends on uh, your build setting. But the default behavior is that if a contract is violated, we have program termination. Your program is broken. The best thing I can do is program termination. And this, is, this probably sounds a very absolute uh, statement, and I will need to soften it later. Uh, what happens if I have, if I write several times a function? Do I need to copy and paste the contract all the times? Not really. Any redeclaration of a function has either the same contract or omits it. So it's uh, valid that the first time that I see your function, I see it with the contract, and then Later on, you show me the function without the contract. That's OK. And that means that in practice, I, I expect that you write the contract in your header file, but in your implementation file, you don't need to copy again and to keep consistency. So here you have this function with a contract, and then I have a declaration with no contract. I have a redeclaration. I'm sorry, this contract is different from this one. So this is a compile error. While this is OK, I've redeclared the function with the same contract. That's OK. But still, we allow that you change names. That's OK. No problem here. So what about checking? Every contract has an associated assertion level. You didn't see this before because there is a default level. So if you don't say nothing, we are in the default level. But in practice, we have four level. Always, default, audit, and action. And depending on the level of your assertion and the level you build your program, a check will be performed or not. So default level can be omitted, and this is why expects and expects default are the same thing. You should use default checks for those checks that are cheap compared to function execution. For example, you have a function with linear complexity, but your checks are uh, constant complexity. That's OK. Now, we also have uh, audit. Audit is expected to mark those checks that are expensive. For example, if you look at the uh, standard library binary search, function. Uh, basically, a precondition of binary search would be that the sequence is sorted. However, that is more expensive to check that the function itself, the function has logarithmic complexity, where the check has linear complexity. OK, in a super safe build, probably for running unit tests in some specific case, you may want to perform this check. 
I don't think you want to perform this check in production. Then we have, this is going to be funny, uh, we have axiom assertions. So axiom assertions are assertions that are never checked. Never. Are they still useful? Uh, first, you can see them as documentation that goes through the compiler. And second, and probably more interesting, is that even if it is not going to be checked, a static analyzer can use this, informa uh, this information, and an optimizer can use this information. So uh, still, this is quite useful. For example, I could do this. I have some algorithm taken to iterators, and then I have this expects a precondition first is different from last, and reachable first last. Now, the interesting thing about this is that I only need to declare reachable. I don't need even to implement reachable because it's an axiom. So th this opens some interesting opportunities. Uh, and then always, always is just the opposite. You cannot avoid this to be checked. This is a super important check that is so critical that you cannot switch it off. Okay, and then, well, we have these levels in the code, but then when you build, you will have a compiler switch to decide in which mode you want to build your program. And the build modes you have is off, no run runtime checking, which means, okay, always, or default, which means only default checks and always checks, or audit, which means default audit everything except action. Now, how do you select the build mode? The only way of selecting the build mode is going to be through some compiler flag. In particular, we state explicitly that there will be no way of accessing, querying, modifying it through your source code programmatically. The only way is outside source code. Uh, how are contexts checked? Well, they are checked uh, one by one. So if you have multiple contexts, you may have multiple expectations separated like here. The second contract, the second check, is only check it if the first one succeeds. And then what do we do when the contract is violated? So as I say, terminate. I need to be more specific. The first thing that uh, will happen is that we will have a contract violation handler which is something that you also set up through your build system. And a contract violation handler is a function that returns nothing and takes an STD contract violation, which will be a new type in the standard library, holding the information of the contract violation. If you do not supply a handler at all, then we will call abort but you, want, you may want to uh, customize this. If you want to supply a handler, you cannot do through source code. The only uh, way of doing this, again, is from the build system. You cannot ask, you cannot change, you cannot get a, a function pointer, nothing at all. Uh, and in security sensitive systems, 
we may prevent that you provide an arbitrary handler. For example, uh, for freestanding implementations uh, or when you build uh, your kernel, you we don't want you to allow any handler, probably only one. <laughs> <laughs> probably only, only one. And th th there are a number of security holes if we allow more than that. Uh, so what is the information we have here? Okay, this is a contract violation and in its current formulation, it has a line number where it happened, a file name, your source file name, your function name, and a command where we expect that you find just uh, as a string uh, the, the, the condition that has been checked. Uh, this might uh, change because there is another proposal uh, under standardization now to standardize a source location. So if this proposal is accepted, we will change this to a source location. Okay. So now what I have a handler. What happens after the violation handler is executed? We have two options. Either the program finishes execution or we resume. So if you don't say nothing, the default option will be after running your handler, the program terminate. Finish execution. But there are cases, there are valid cases where you want to resume. So you will have this off and on thing. And again, no way of checking through code or querying this kind uh, of thing. So why would you want to continue after you know your program is broken? Because if your program is broken, you cannot be very confident on the state of your program. We have detected that something uh, went wrong. Still, there are some valid cases. The first one is gradual introduction of contracts. Let's say that you have today a library. But it's not perfect. But your application using that library works. Now, and you want to introduce contracts, and you write all your annotations, and then the program fails because, you know, the library was not perfect, was half perfect. But, but you say, oh, my, but my program works. What you really want to do is to introduce the contracts, use a handler that logs what's going on, fix the bugs, and you are done. And in that case, for this temporal situation, you want to enable resuming. At the end, you don't want to resume, but during this process, you may want uh, to resume. So this is a valid use case. The other use case is writing the unit tests for the contracts. The contracts are part of your code, you should unit test your contracts too. But if you are testing violating contracts and we terminate, this is going to give a very hard time for some unit test frameworks. So probably in your unit test build, what you want is enable resume. Not for your production build, but for testing. And also, if you have an application with plugins, probably you don't want that a contract violation in your plugin kills the main application. So that is probably less interesting, but the first two are quite interesting use cases. Other than that, the recommendation would be don't resume. Because think uh, of a very simple case. Let's say that you are calling a function whose precondition 
is don't give me a null pointer. And you are a bad guy and give a gi null pointer. Okay, we detect, we run our handler, we log somewhere something bad happened, but if we resume, you still have the problem. And you cannot be confident uh, in the state, probably you have written in some uh, memory location that you shouldn't, and you are going to have a very buggy uh, behavior. So what happens with optimizations? Well, the assertions might be used by optimizer. So I, so this is important, but because this means that even assert is not the same as your today's C assert assert, which, I, which is just a macro. I'm not a macro star. <laughs> okay. So now this is a real thing that your compiler understands. And because your compiler understands, it can use that information to feed the optimizer. OK. Yep. Assert failures do not lead to a undefined uh, behavior. Uh, so here I have a pointer and I say the pointer is different than null. Okay, so I know that this is never going to happen, so I can optimize out the whole block. Well, I say this in general, I, I was not talking about the language uh, feature. Yes, you are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, wait, wait. Red here. Continuation after violation is undefined behavior. So the thing about continuation is that it is there for very specific cases. It is not meant for real production code. Over there? Well, uh, uh, you said uh, in multi-threading. Well, in, ma in multi-threading, what, uh, what happens is that the function is running in a thread, so there is no difference. So you are, you are in a thread, and you are calling your function from a thread. So if you call the, the same function from two different threads, uh, it depends if the precondition is using some shared variable or not. If it is using some shared variable, then, then it's your responsibility to uh, guarantee no race condition in using the precondition. So we are not providing no specific help for that. Don't use globals or global state for preconditions. Especially mutable global state for preconditions is quite risky. It can be done, but it's quite risky. Eh? Well, uh, you have you can using a contract 
whatever you can use at the call side. So that means that if there, there is a global variable accessible, you can use it. But it's not that they are captured. You are using the original ones. So don't think it something like what we do in lambdas, uh, capturing. No. You are using the real one. And that means that you can use uh, function arguments or you can use uh, globals, basically. No more than that. No local state can be used. Uh, I have a slide later, I think. Yeah, uh, otherwise, I will answer uh, at the end. Before that, no except. What happens to no except function when the contact is broken? If continuation mode is set to off, the program finishes. No difference. If the continuation mode is set to on, the program resumes, but if the handler throws an exception, which could happen, then you are throwing an exception from a no except context, and the only sensible thing we can do is apply the general rules from the language and terminate. So in this case, I have a function that expects its argument to be greater than zero, and I am calling with minus one. I'm invoking terminate if the handler throws. Otherwise, now, yeah. If an exception, if uh, it's the same case. because the precondition is logically part of the function. So if you throw from the precondition and the, your function is not accept, we have to terminate. That is arguable, I know. What we have defined at this point is to report the first violation, period, the first violation. But however, however, this is what we are requiring. Recall that the contact violation has a field called comment. Implementations are free to add more information there. So what happens with interfaces? Any redeclaration of a function has either the same contact or completely omits it. You have seen this before. Uh, now, what happens with preconditions? The expression that you put in a precondition may use your arguments and any non-local object. That means that if I have this concept pair and this global object, uh, then I could write the following contact. This is okay because X is an argument. This is uh, okay, X is an argument and max is a non-local. Uh, this is okay, S is an argument, and this is okay, name is a non-local. So all these are okay. Concesper. I knew I had a slide with Concesper. So the expression of a precondition from a Concesper function may use functions argument, any non-local object that is Concesper, but cannot use non-local objects that are not Concesper because you don't know 
about them. So, and you could not evaluate them in a conscious per uh, context. That means, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Same is lexically the same except for changes in argument names. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we might slightly consider those cases. Now uh, uh, the wording says lexically the same, which is uh, token by token, except name changes. So that would mean, yes, you are right, that zero and zero u are not the same token. And probably this is something that we have to consider. Yep, you are right. You, you are right. And with the current wording, they they would not be the same. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you say. You are right. Uh, well, the the only argument for may, uh, making this requirement was. Uh, providing a very simplified proposal because one thing is that with what we decided for C20 is have a proposal with minimal features. There are a number of things in our roadmap once we have something in the language. So we do not want to add a complete thing. And I may mention at the end a number of things that I would like to have and that we are not having for this proposal. Any other question? Yep. No, we don't. Yeah, we don't. Uh, yes. So we we have a blanket statement. You should not do that, but we are not requiring compilers to do it. In f in practice, because this in general cannot be checked because we have separate compilation and you may be uh, calling for evaluating the precondition a function whose source code you cannot see. So you are dead. We cannot require this in general. And then it's quality of implementation, how much a compiler can check. Yep. Can you speak up please? Yes, but then we would not be throwing exceptions. And I would, re I would recommend that you don't throw exceptions for checking correctness. W uh, yes, and then you would have a contact violation. Yes, you can, uh, what you can do is uh, s uh, set a handler and the continuation mode off. But we cannot associate with a specific precondition uh, a specific exceptions. Wait, it will come back, I hope. Uh, 
it's a global mechanism. So I it's a global mechanism. And the, uh, the thing is that we, thi w we really think that having a specific exceptions for this kind of check is not what we expect you to do. I know that you today you have code like that. I know. That today you have code that checking preconditions are throwing exceptions. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, but look, then you have what some people call a white contract, which means that you passing a null pointer is not a contract violation because it's something that is handled by the function itself. Yeah, so that's a, a different a different thing. Uh, w we can take this uh, at the end if you want. Yeah, I, I have 16 more slides just to let you know. Uh, you have to wait. I have a slides for that. So can I go on? Okay, a program with a contact expression that performs a modification of an object is ill-formed. And your compiler, as I said, might give you a diagnostic, but this is not something that can be done uh, in general. Okay, so this is something that is, is ill-formed, this is something that is ill-formed. What, uh, thi this is another contention point. If a postcondition uses an argument and the body of the function modifies th that value, the program is ill-formed. And here we are different to other uh, context uh, programming models because usually many of them you have the pre-value and the post-value. We decided for now, I'm not saying that this could evolve in the future, that if you have here x and in your post condition you use x and your body modifies x, this is ill-formed. We do not allow you to do that. If you want, you have today a workaround which would be do it manually, take a copy, and put an assert in the body. Not nice, not perfect, but allows to have a simplified proposal. Uh, but in the case of pointers, recall that the content of the pointer is not the value of the pointer. So that means that even if you modify an object through the pointer, you can uh, still include your pointer in your uh, post condition. Templates. The expression of a contact from a function template or a member function of a class template may be used in the, in the check. So here I have size as a template argument and I can use it here. Visibility, public private thing. So a public function can only use public members in the contract. A protected function, well, the contract in a protected in a protected function can only use public unprotected functions. So in particular. That means that if I have this class table, which has a data member size, which is private, I cannot use size in my contract. Because the contract should be something that is checkable by the caller. If you do want to do this, probably you need to uh, provide a valid range uh, member function or a size member function or well that is something to be designed by you. Function pointers. I said before that contracts are not part of the function type. 
So that means that the function pointer does not include the contract. And a call to a function pointer to a function that has a contract performs checking only once. So basically that means I have, uh, for example, this function pointer type is an error because when you define a function pointer type or you define a function pointer, you cannot state contacts. Now, if I have this function and I have a function pointer, I can use this function pointer to point to a function that has a contact. That's the difference here. Uh, inheritance. Function references. Okay, the, the we didn't think about that one. So th that that is going to my to do list. Yeah. Okay. Ten slides, five minutes. I will take questions at the end. Okay, so inheritance. Uh, an overriding function needs to have the very same contract. So in practice, that means that we are not allowing modifying the contract in a derived class. There is a lot of theory about how this needs to be done, what is uh, should be done or not. We took the restrictive path of you have to have exactly the same contract. So basically that means that if I, I have this function and I re redefine my virtual function here, I do not write a contract because it's going to have exactly the same contract. Okay, if you want, you, want, you can rewrite it again but you cannot modify the contract. Uh, so, you may repeat it, but you cannot change uh, the contract. So this is a, an error because I have changed the contract. And you cannot add anything to your contract, okay? Because uh, here you have no contact, and I am adding a contact in the derived. You cannot do this kind of thing. Uh, precondition weakening, which is done in many uh, Eiffel used to do that. You cannot do that here. Uh, you can simulate it. And the way of simulating it would be the extra conditioning would be an assert in the base and would, would evaporate in the derived. And the same thing happens with post-condition strengthening. Okay, it can be simulated, and we decided not to put this in this proposal right now. So, I it seems finally I might be on time. As a summary, recall this position that correctness and robustness are orthogonal and they should be handled by independent language features. Preconditions and postconditions are part of the function's interface. They are not an implementation detail, while assertion are, is an implementation detail. The assertion level specifies under which build levels the checking should happen. Uh, by the way, if you want to start do doing this, you can simulate some of these things today with the GC GSL support library from the CPP core guidelines where they are implemented as evil macros. Uh, but uh, this will ease a lot the transition and is quite useful. Besides that, if you want something more, we have recently published uh, in GitHub, a prototype implementation of CLang. So it's not finished, it's uh, still under initial test, 
There are a number of features or from those that I have been telling you today that are not yet implemented, but we are on the way of, of having things. And you have the expects, you have the insures, uh, you have the asset. We still do not support constructors, destructors, and some things in templates. So we, we are working on it. So that's it. <laughs>